Welcome everybody. We're going to be working on unit two in the Apple Swift Fundamentals book. I am using the teacher's version. I'm on page 33 where unit two starts. Uh, we're also going to be digging through the, the playgrounds that go with this unit. So if you haven't, uh, make sure that you download the, the data files. You can download, uh, if you want to do the same thing that we're doing, download the student data files and, and unzip them. Um, you can also pull down the teacher versions. Those are also available. We are going to be working on this first playground here called strings. And I'm just going to go ahead and, and open that up. And then we're just going to start moving through here. Now, I, I realize that for those that took the first course, the explorations course, that um, we're doing a little bit of repeat here. And I, and I kind of mentioned this before that um, the way this course starts out is like it reintroduces you to all the concepts and then takes each one of them a little deeper than <laughs> excuse me, what we did before. Um, and thank you. And uh, the strings are uh, included in that. So we're gonna, yeah, we're doing some rudimentary stuff, but I, I promise you it will get more interesting as we go. Um, but it's okay to reinforce, uh, you know, by the way, any programming knowledge reinforced is a, is a good thing. So here's our, our first uh, playground and um, let's kind of start reading through it. And it says, create and name a constant and assign it a string literal representing your name. All right, so they want us to do a constant here. So let's just go ahead and do this. So we can say, let name equal, and then you know, put your name in there, however you want to place it. So there's mine. Hi. I am having an issue where <laughs> I opened up that playground and it's just Oh wait, no, now it's working. Sorry. I was getting a blank screen that said no editor every ah, time I opened okay. it. So it was just being yeah. resistant. It was, yeah. Now yeah. it finally loaded. Sorry. <laughs> you know what? Well, you know, Jonathan, I, I'm glad that you actually spoke up because like we were talking a little bit earlier uh amongst us, you know. So this group's been this is the second time we're together taking uh, you know these Apple Swift classes. Um and Jomar, you made the suggestion to Jonathan last week when he was having performance issues, really <laughs> kind of in a silly way. Have you tried rebooting? You know, and, and on the Mac, that's like like sacrilege, right? But you know what? It did solve a lot of your problems, Jonathan, didn't it? It did. Yeah. <laughs> a, a reboot can do amazing things. A lot of times just shutting down the software and restarting it can do the same thing. And if you don't want to do a complete shutdown, another option is, shut down your software and then sign out or log out of your account and log back in. Cause that like refreshes a lot of the operating system stuff too. Okay. Um, but I'm assuming your engine is working now. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, it's working. Now. Okay. <laughs> all right. So the, our first task was, all right, create a name constant. And I named it just the way they suggested and assign a string literal representing your name. And it says, create a favorite quote constant and assign it the following string literal. All right, so let's do that. I'm going to do that down here. We're going to say let favorite quotes equal. And um, all right, so I'm going to say my favorite quote is, and then we need to um come up with a famous quote uh which, and i mean my favorite favorite quote is um and i want you to notice okay so th they do have a little impetus here for us and, and this is kind of a test right so i'm putting together a string literal and it's already a string right but what they mm -hmm. want me to do is put a quote inside of a quote and if you look at the output it's going to result in having double quotes around the quote, which is impossible to do inside of double quotes unless we do what? What's the magic sauce to make double quotes appear inside of double quotes? Would it be if we use single quotes on the outside and double quotes inside? You know, that is that is actually one way. So you know what? Let's test that approach. So here we go. So what Jonathan is suggesting is that we do this put single quotes on the outside. Okay, now Jonathan, that's a pretty intuitive answer because if I was using JavaScript or Python or Java, 
or heck a dozen different languages that would totally work yeah that's where i got that yeah you idea notice from <laughs> that, you notice that that swift however is not liking that it, right i can't even do a string with single quotes so that is not the answer unfortunately what the answer is that they're shooting for is what we call an escape sequence right so the most common one that we use typically as we'll do a backslash n which does what gives us a new line right mm -hmm. right but what if i do backslash double quote and then say um what's my favorite movie quote uh i am your father and we'll close the quote and we'll do backslash double quote and then notice, you know, you can see it in the sidebar, obviously, right? That that is working, right? So if you use what we call an escape sequence and you do backslash double quote, it will allow you to insert the double quote as text. So that that that's the trick to it. And really what they're kind of pushing us towards here. That's the one solution. And you know what? Um, it is asking us to print it. So really we should do this. And then that should output just fine at the bottom. All right. Now it's asking us to write an if else statement that prints, there's nothing here if empty string is empty. And it's not as empty as I, as I thought otherwise. Okay, so let's do that. Now, notice they've done us the courtesy of creating at least the beginning part of it, right? And we need an if else stuff. And so we're going to say if what? If that's yeah, spelled right, empty string is equivalent. Can, do that. can I do it like this? Yes, that's one way you can do it. Um, then what happens? Well, okay. So we're reviewing our if statements now, but yeah, we have to put we have to put curlies in. Swift requires them, right? So I can't skip them. We discovered that too, right? Like if I was in Java, I could skip the curly bracket if it's if it's one statement, but in uh, in Swift, no, no, no. You gotta you gotta include that, and we want it to print. Um, there's nothing there or nothing here if it's indeed empty else close curly brackets we're going to print appropriate like um it's not as empty as i thought okay and it is empty though isn't it? So what if I change that empty string and just type a space in it? Is it now empty? Mm, yes. No. No? Oh, no. Dang, no. no. It, it, right. So like a space is still a character on the keyboard and it does occupy memory when I'm storing it. So just by adding a space there, that approves that um, we're changing it. All right. I assume you guys are okay with this one. Mm -hmm. right. um, but but you see what I mean, right? Like they're starting to talk about strings, something we already kind of know about. And you're like, oh no, they're going to tell us what a string is again. No, they're like, just remember strings. Here's some stuff you can do with them. And very quickly they're ramping it up, right? And reinforcing concepts. Um, the escape sequence for a double quote is important knowing that you can't use single quotes to encapsulate a string is important um, and that a space counts inside of a string as something it's not nothing uh, that all of those are important and remembering the if else statement too right so just to remember how to do it all, all right let's go to the next page so this one's called concatenation and interpolation right so if you remember concatenation is the process of joining two strings together it's like string math, right? It's like string addition. Um, interpolation is a whole different thing. Interpolation is where we can use 
a variable name directly inside of a string to output a string without having to concatenate the string. All right, so just to explain, look, we'll go through their, their process here. It says, create a city constant and assign it a string literal representing your home city. All right, so let's do that. Let me say, let a uh, city equal me, um, born here, lived here, <laughs> never left here. You know, it's like pretty true for a lot of Wisconsinites, I guess, but yeah, that, that's where I'm at, right? So if you guys are watching this video, I'm in the city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, oh boy, right? Um, all right, so there it is. It says, then create a state constant and assign it a string literal representing your home state. Okay, piece of cake. State equal, quotes here, Wisconsin. Finally, create a home constant. And so let home equal. And then it says use string concatenation to assign it a string representing your home city and state. So for example, they're saying Portland, Oregon. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna, since Milwaukee is stored, I'm just gonna call in city. I'm gonna concatenate to it with a plus sign a comma, right, so inside of quotes, of course, a space, and then I'm going to concatenate to it with the plus sign again, the state. Now we can see in the sidebar that it's already working, right? Um, and that's kind of the, the point of these sidebars, and I can't get it to expand, whatever. You know, this is uh, playgrounds being resistant, but you can always do a print command and you can just print home. And then at the bottom in the console, you should see Milwaukee comma space Wisconsin. But this process here of taking something that's a string, joining it to a string, and then joining it to something else that's also a string, that's called concatenation. So that's one way that we can take pieces of string, join them, make a new string, and then output something fresh. All right. All right. So let's follow their next instruction. It says use the compound assignment operator plus equals to add home to introduction below and print the value of introduction. So if you guys are following what it's saying, well, the first first thing we notice is that introduction is a variable, so I can change. So if I want to change introduction, I can say introduction. And then I say plus equals, and this is kind of weird because normally we use plus equals for math, right? So this is just a reminder that because the plus sign is a concatenation symbol, we can also use plus equals on strings and build strings the same way. And you can see the introduction currently says, I live in with a space at the end. And now I can just take home. That will add to introduction. You can already see it working in the sidebar. <laughs> but then we'll we'll print, and then what you will see is I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So it's taking what's in introduction, it's concatenating with the plus equals whatever we've concatenated up here, and so I can take one concatenated thing, add it to another concatenated thing, and I'll put it off. A real common technique, and I and I say. Um, you know, for app building, especially when you're doing like uh, output uh, web pages, right? So this this is a, a web programmer uh, technique is often you will create this variable that holds like the page contents and you keep concatenating more HTML or output stuff to it. And then at the end of the document, you just output one thing and the whole page pops up, right? Now that's kind of what we're doing here is we're, pieces of information, we're joining them together into other objects. Uh, then we add another object here, right? We're adding the concatenation we already did to that one, and then we're outputting it and we just keep adding and, and it's, it's grabbing all of it and putting it out. It's kind of a, a simple but clever technique. All right, let's see the, the, uh, the next thing here. And it says declare a name constant and 
assign it your name as a string literal. We already did this, right? So we'll do let name equal, I'll just put my first name. They want you also to declare an age constant. So we'll say let age equal. And, um, and it's asking, give it your current age as an integer. All right, and so for me, uh, it's it's 29. I mean, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Add 30 years to that. <laughs> the wish, the wishful thinking. 30 years ago, that would have been accurate. Uh, but yeah, 59 is is my current age as an integer. Um, and then they want us to print the following phrase using string interpolation. So I want you to think about this here. Um, so we're going to print a string. And then in that string, they want us to insert the name and insert the age into those spots. So I can I can actually go right to a print command. This is really kind of the point of this. So I'm just gonna go print, I'm putting in my double quotes and closing it right away. So I have my whole structure. Then I'm just gonna copy what they have there. I'm gonna say, my name is, and then if you remember how to do string interpolation, right? This is what the, the recall is on this. You use a backslash, just like an escape sequence. But then you, inside of parentheses, you put in the name of your variable directly in the string output. So my name is backslash parentheses name. And after my next birthday, I will be, and then this time we're going to insert age. like so so you got you can see the output at the bottom but the, this approach of inserting a variable right into a string is called string interpolation that saves us the hassle of like using a concatenation approach because that could work too in a print statement so for example if I was, you know, just looking at the previous examples, if I was to say, um, if I took this exactly and just dropped it inside my print statement, that would work, right? <clears throat> it, it is working, right? If you guys are wondering, yeah. that, that is absolutely working. But, um, this approach is concatenation, and I, I'm still getting the variables on the screen. But what a lot of programmers are really preferring these days is the string interpolation approach allows you to work with one string and one set of double quotes and not have to worry about like, okay, now I got to do a plus sign, add a space, and then put a comma, and then another plus sign, and add the variable. This is a whole lot easier because the spaces and stuff are already there, right? They're in front of it and behind it. And then this spot's just replaced with whatever the variable is or the constant, whether it's an integer, a double, a string, it doesn't matter, right? Um, that's not one that you really need to uh, do at the bottom, but that's just an example. All right, let's uh, move on. The next one is actually an app exercise. So this is one that you have to <coughs> submit for points. Um, so let's read through it. And it says, these exercises reinforce Swiss concepts in the con context of a fitness tracking app. Oh, joy, right? We'll be revisiting that thing. Um, and it says, in your app, you may want to search for other users. This would be easier with first and last names stored separately. This is not an uncommon practice, right? So very commonly, when we grab user information, we will store first name and last name in separate variables. They want us to create first name and last name constants and assign them string literals representing the user's first and last name respectively. Um, and then create a full name constant that uses concatenation to combine them and print the full name. Okay, so that's a series of steps. So let's do these one at a time. We'll do first name. whatever data you want. I'm using uh, my real stuff, I guess. There's my, my last name. 
Um, <clears throat> then they want us to create another constant called full name, which is just going to take first name and concatenate the last name. But if I concatenate them, I want to put a space in between. So I have to do this, right? I want spaces in there. Um, last name. Of course, we want to print this because it told us to. Print full name. And then you should see in the sidebar there my full name with a space in between. So hopefully that one worked for you. Mm -hmm. That worked for me. All right. <clears throat> this next one says, okay, occasionally users of your fitness tracking app will beat the previous goals or records. You may want to notify them when this happens for encouragement purposes. So create a new constant, congratulations, and assign it a string literal that uses string interpolation to create the following string. All right. So we have these are already created, previous best, new best, right? And now we're just gonna, we're gonna do this straight up in a print statement, right? So let's just go right to a print statement here and double quotes. Let's just start copying the message. Congratulations. It says insert user's full name here. Well, I have full name above, right? So if I do string interpolation and just do full name, I have it. There you go. Uh, and then we want an exclamation point after, and then the rest of it will say, you beat your previous daily high score of, and now it wants us to insert previous highest steps here. So the previous best is what we want. Backslash, friends, and the variable, excuse me, constant name of previous best. Add a space after it. And then steps by walking space. Then it says insert new highest steps here. So once again, string interpolation. And we'll put in our new best, a space, and we'll say, steps yesterday. <coughs> and it is telling you insert full name, previous best, new best, where indicated and print the value of congratulations. So we're doing that directly in one statement. Okay. And actually I'm not following the directions, am I? I am not at all following the directions. In fact, <laughs> the directions say, so if you really want to do this correctly, they want congratulations. I'm just going to call mine congrats, by the way, um, to be equal to that string, you see. And why this is important is string interpolation can be stored. Yeah. So it can walk or travel with its variables. And then they just want you to print it. So you just do print, congrats. Like that, and then it should get the right thing on the screen. All right, all okay? Yep, works for me. Excellent. All right, we'll leave that on the screen for just a second, but we're moving yep, on. To it next. works. All right, here we go. <clears throat> All right, so this one says create two constants, name in caps and name, assign name in caps your name as a string literal with proper capitalization, and assign name as your name as a string literal in a lowercase. All right, and then, all right, let, let's just do those first two steps because that, that's kind of enough to start with. So we're gonna say name in caps equals your name as a string literal with proper capitalization. So in other words, I'm reading that as this. That's what I'm reading, right? 
Then they want another one. This one's going to be just called name. And um, same thing, but all lowercase. So the name, all lowercase, no caps. Then it says, write an if else that checks to see if name and caps and name are the same. All right, so let's let's do that. We're gonna say name in caps equal equal. If that's true, we'll execute some code. Right. So if they're the same, so that would be the first statement here. We would print the two strings are equal. Else, I get a print statement in there. The two things are not equal. There's the, the messages. Now, of course, we know they're not equal, right? Now, there is this kind of um, there's kind of a, a reason why we're covering this. I, I, I was covering this, this topic with my Python people this morning too. <clears throat> so for example, if you have a user type in some information, right? Um, and think about it. Like if you were sitting on your phone and you're prompted, enter your name, right? Um, do you go to the trouble? You, know, you may say yes or no on this of like hitting shift and then typing the first letter capital and most of our like phone keyboards now will then switch to lowercase automatically, right? And then if you hit space and then start typing your last name, you have to hit shift again to get the capital. You, you guys feel where I'm going with this, right? It's really, really easy, especially on a phone to make a mistake, right? And if I, let's say I was like looking up my name on a system as a full name like that. Um, and then I type it in lowercase because that's just what worked out better for me. Um, is it necessarily incorrect? I mean, we know it's the same name. You see, you see what, the, what the point is. So the, the thought here is that when users are inputting information, you sometimes have to accommodate for the fact that it's going to be cumbersome for them to change the case or make the, the case correct in order to enter the stuff correctly. Um, and it, notice what the next thing says. It says, write a new if else statement that also checks to see if name and caps and name are the same. However, this time use lowered case, the method on each constant to compare the lower case versions of the string, All right? So in other words, we have the same two names here, but now we're just gonna rewrite this if statement. So I'm just gonna, just grab the if statement and drop it in here, right? But <clears throat> the only change I'm going to make is I'm going to add to it this method call of lower case. And I'm not applying it just to one. I'm applying it to both like this. So if we take the two strings and we lowercase both of them, so now we're looking at the same thing. Now are they the same? And you know what? Now the, now the response is the two strings are equal. Now, these are choices that you make when you're building apps, right? Are you going to allow the one thing to be equal to the other or not? Is capital A the same as lowercase a? Well, technically, no, right? But if you ask somebody, is that an apple or an orange? And it's an apple and one person types capital A apple and the other person types lowercase apple, it's the same apple. Right, they're right either way. So sometimes, based on your logic, you have to either shift everything to lowercase or uppercase or whatever to equalize the playing field so that you make sure you're looking at, you know, is it an apple or not? Doesn't matter if it's upper or lowercase. Didn't we do this with the quiz app? Yeah, we did totally. Yeah, yeah, we did do that. Um, <clears throat> so that's a good recollection for sure. But that's a really common programming technique, especially with, with strings. All right, so this next one says, Imagine you're looking through a list of names to find that, to find any that end in junior. Write an if statement below that will check if the junior 
if junior has the suffix jr period right capital j r and period if it does then print we found a second generation name okay so how do we concoct this one okay, let's go if what are we checking for junior all right now the point of this one is that we will try to figure out if jr period is contained within cal ripkin jr how do i write code that says that do you guys remember this one I do not. Yeah. Um, I know that it's done with a method. I think that there's kind of a little bit of a, a, a clue here. <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm going to read past where we are right now. So check it out. So suppose you're trying to find a documented computer that contains Ham, Hamlet's famous soliloquy by Shakespeare. You write a simple app that will check every document to see if it contains the phrase to be or not to be. You decide to do this with the with the contains method right and so the contains method looks like this right and write an if statement that will check so is this the way that we should do it okay so here's what i'm gonna do i'm just gonna pause on that question for a second okay so we took a little bit of a pause in class and I just kind of put this out as a challenge because it's kind of like trying to recall like obscure stuff we learned last semester that we maybe use like once or twice, you know, kind of thing. Um, but one thing that's really kind of neat, especially when you're working with strings and one of the reasons why we're doing this is strings have lots of libraries attached to them for doing processing of, of the string information, including one um, that checks to see if you have a prefix or a suffix that matches a very literal string. So um, for example, I can take that constant that I created junior and I can just say, and, and isn't it interesting? I just hit a dot and look at the second option there has prefix. That's not the one I want, but has suffix. That totally is the one I want. So I'm gonna choose that. And then inside here, I can just literally say, has suffix um, jr period like that so um so that's going to evaluate the true or false if it has uh that suffix well then we would put some sort of a a message on the screen what does it say what is um if it does print we found a second generation name okay, so let's just do that we just say print found a second generation just curious because um i i did this differently um could you do dot contains you yeah you you know what you could right so so that's why like before when i said you know i can think of at <laughs> least a couple ways to do it and, and there yeah. might be more um contains is one right but so think about like you know the has prefix and has suffix mm -hmm. are pretty useful ones because those imply prefix of course the beginning of the string suffix the end of the string right so that those are kind of the low-hanging fruit here but yeah, it, it makes sense i mean if you use the contains method that one would work too because um does cal ripkin jr contain jr period it does it doesn't matter if it's in the middle or not right right and that's kind of really the difference between the two approaches is recognizing um basically that fact right is um which is which all right let's try this next one um and you notice here they they do the import of the foundation here and they um have two constants. So one is the text to search through to be or not to be, that is the question. And then 
a separate little thing here that is the actual text to search for, which is to be or not to be. And you will notice ooh, there's case differences right off the bat, right? So if I ask the simple question, which it wants, um, is to be or not to be contained in to be or not to be, that is the question. Well, it sort of is, but not exactly, right? So we already kind of did this before, right? Mm -hmm. Now, so one thing that we could do, like I could write, just for example, an if statement where I take the one, right? And I lowercase it, take the other one and lowercase it. And then I could, you know, potentially in this situation say, um, has prefix, does this have a prefix that matches this one lowercase so that that would be one way to do it right but what they're mm -hmm. really trying to show us how to use here is the contains method so let me write that one out so you can see what i mean by that so here we're going to say if the text oops to search through the top line let that go and then lowercase so we want to like make them you know apples to apples right um and then i would do a comparison however what we're learning here is not only that strings have different methods that control or search or whatever but you can take those methods and you can do this thing we call chaining the commands basically so first we're going to take that text to search through we're going to lowercase it and then we're going to ask if it contains right and then we put in the expression that we want and you see how this pops up this is kind of weird but where what are we looking for it to contain that would be the text to search for also lowercase now i i can see behind the scenes here to see that you know, I need, don't really need the lowercase. I, I could make it work even without that, right? But it's kind of like a string running a method on it, chaining another method to it. And inside of that method, we're doing another method on a different string to see if it's true or false. So it's kind of, it's really kind of clever. I mean, it, 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 this is a really neat little tool this one, of course, I could select something out of the middle of it and it would work, right? That's why this one's particularly useful. And then all they really want us to do here is just put in a goofy message like, I found it. Something like that. And that should be the case. Now, what if I, what if I changed it though? What, you know, what if the thing that I'm searching for is space not to be? Well, that's in there too. See, the, and see, that's the difference between like the prefix approach and not. So uh, it can be in the middle of the string. It's still looking for the exact thing. If you're worried about case, you convert to one case or the other, either all lowercase or all uppercase, and then you then check to see if it it's contained. So this is really a handy little thing, uh, very useful for doing searches, right? Uh, if you're writing. Um, the last little exercise here is print to the console the number of characters in your name by using the count property on name. Okay, that's really pretty simple. But what they're trying to get you to recall is that with name, for, for example, when we're doing this type of thing, we're doing dot and then we're adding a method or a function to the end of it. It has parentheses, right? That, that's a method. That's what we call that. But if we're looking at a property, which is often something that's computed, we do a dot and then just call the property. There's no parentheses because this is already a calculated value. You see, it looks at the object, it counts it and then brings it back. And um, it's saying 11 with the space, which is correct for me, right? So I have five in my first, five in my last and the space in between. So yeah, that's the count, but that that we would call a property. So, I mean, if you're really particular about the naming conventions of things, um, you know, anything that's 
dot a thing with parentheses, that's a method. Anything that's dot without parentheses is a property, generally speaking. Properties are often either hard coded or computed uh, through mathematically. All right, let's move on to the uh, the app exercise here. And this one's called password entry and user search. It says these exercises reinforce with concepts. Okay, wonderful. Uh, <laughs> you, you think it might be fun to incorporate some friendly competition into your fitness tracking app. Users will be able to compare with friends and small fitness challenges. However, to do this, users will need a password protected account. Write an if else statement below that will check that the entered username and password uh, match the stored username and password. While the password should be case sensitive, users should be able to log in even if they entered the username with the wrong capitalization. Now, this is actually kind of a universal truth with sign-in systems because a lot of our sign-in sign systems kind of like propagate out from um, Unix and Linux servers, by the way. And, and if we're on the Mac OS, you know, that's actually what we're working on. Um, and for whatever reason, and I'm not sure why they came up with this, but like they figured out that like if you're on a machine and you get an email account and that email account has a domain name attached to it, that email must be unique to that domain or that system, right? That's kind of an interesting thought, right? So why do a lot of organizations use your email account as your username? Because they already know it's unique. That's the why, right? Because you can only have one username that way. It is irrelevant, by the way, in an email address, how you capitalize your username part of the email address. On the remote system, it either all becomes uppercase or all becomes lowercase. The case is ignored. So if you have an email address where you have like a capital letter in there, sorry, that's not catching. <laughs> right. And that's really what they're enforcing here. Right. <clears throat> if the user name and password match, print you're now logged in. Otherwise, print, please check your username and password and try again. All right. All right. So we can see here now that we have a stored. Uh, username, a stored password, uh, the entered username and entered password. Now we're assuming, right? Like if you were running a real app, you'd have somebody like enter this stuff right now. We're just hard coding it just so we can run the code. Our task really is to write the right if statement to make it work. So that's what we're going to focus on here. And I want you to think about the logic of what we're about to do before we type out the code. Right, because we have very specific instructions above. And all right, it says write an if else statement that will check that the entered username and password match the stored username and password. That's the grand goal. While the password should be case sensitive, the user should be able to log in even if their name is, has the wrong capitalization. So the username will do the lowercase thing on that one but the password has to be exactly correct all right so let's handle those one piece at a time so here comes the if statement we're going to say if the entered username switch to lowercase so we're going to lowercase it is equivalent to the stored username also lowercase that has to be true doesn't matter if they got the upper or lowercase right. Same user, same user, right? There's only one user with that collection of characters. But we also have to have the password correct. So we're going to do an, a logical and. So we're going to have a compound if statement here. We're going to check first for username. And then we're going to check for password. With the password, it is case sensitive. So I'm not lowercasing this. I'm just going to say is the entered password the same as the stored password? And then, of course, we'll want a success message. And the success message could be something like, uh, you are now logged in, because that's what they told us to say. And then the else, you can come up with whatever snarky message you want here. But something that indicates that it did not succeed, 
uh, I'm going to say what the book says, which is please check your username and password. Now, we haven't reached the point in these playgrounds yet where we're doing loops, right? But if you wrote a loop, you could put this in a loop and it would keep running until it's correct. Or uh, after three tries, maybe it would give up, you know, that, that type of thing. This is a really common thing. And, and the, the unfortunate thing is, and I'll have you guys think about this, is when you're writing apps and you're dealing with usernames and passwords, we're comparing strings. So is your username and password stored somewhere as a string on your system? That's kind of an interesting thought right there. The answer is yes, but not in a plain string typically that you can see, right? It's usually encrypted and then hashed, right? So that it's converted into something really cryptic. And then when we're checking the username and especially the password, we have to decrypt the hash and then match it, right? So this is kind of like a whole process. Uh, once again, it happens pretty instantaneously when you create an app, but we take it for granted. But common technique. In the real old days of IT, we didn't encrypt the usernames and passwords, right? That's really dangerous though, because if you're on a system, somebody can get onto the file system or into the operating system and can navigate around and look at things and they can see usernames and passwords in plain text, big problem. If they are hashed and encrypted, well, then they would have to know the decryption in order to see it, which is unlikely, right? Uh, so that's kind of the why. All right, so that, that was part one. Um, next part it says, now that users can log in, they need to be able to search through a list of users to find their friends. This might normally be done by having a user enter their name and then looping through all the usernames to see if the username contains the search term entered. Okay, we're going to do loops later, like it says. So for now, you just work through one cycle of that. So imagine you're searching for a friend whose username is Step Challenger, and you enter Step into a search bar, and the app begins to search. When the app comes to the name Step Challenger, and notice how it's lowercase here, it checks to see if Step Challenger, uppercase, contains Step, right? And... So it says using username and search name below, when they already given to us, write an if else statement that checks to see if username contains the search term, the search should not be case sensitive. Okay. All right, let's, let's do that. All right. So we have some givens here. And so let's start to type. We need an if statement. And we were told, right, that, that with the username, right, lower cased. Um, is the thing to do. Once again, we're going to use the contains command. So here we are chaining the commands. And then what are we searching for here? The search name, right? That just a little play middle step thing. Right. That's that's the logic, right? This, now notice this is a repeat of what we did on the last slide, but it's actually simpler. Um, and then if it does find it, we want a message and we're going to say, uh, I found step challenger. And, and, you know, truth be told, you know, I might say um, that's not really what the search term is. You, I, I always think the uh, string interpolation is better here. Um, and actually what they're, what they're finding is the search name, right? So it actually found step. Um, this is me overachieving on this, of course, because I'm not happy with the output. <laughs> right, and this would work, right? So like, it doesn't matter what the username is, um, upper lower case, it, it found that inside this username. And truth be told, you know, if there were other users that had STEP in any upper lowercase format inside the username, this would catch all of them in a loop. Otherwise, it's singular. But this is this is the solution for this one. All right, you guys, 
let's go ahead and, and um, stop this video and then we're going to take a break. Okay. Um, and I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pause the recording. I'll, I'll do the first two playgrounds in the same video. Okay. All right. Welcome back, everybody. And uh, we're going to be moving into the second playground here in Unit 2 in just a minute. Uh, but we just finished up the uh, the playground related to strings. And I want you to look at the, the vocabulary there on that list. That's one thing I wanted to point out is did did we uh, talk about all of these uh, topics here? We did, you know, pretty much. Um, maybe not exactly in this way, but we did cover all of it. Um, I am looking at the teacher's version of the book. And I say this both from the perspective of, you know, being a student, right? The fact that you have access to the teacher's edition. Um, it's not like there's any like magical answers in here or something, but there is more complete information and guidance on how to do some of the tasks that we do in the class. The other thing that they have, and I'll, and I'll have you notice, and this is more common in this uh, second book, is they actually have keynotes, uh, or, you know, which are like PowerPoints basically that they build into the book as well. And if you um, click on that and go into it, I'm just going to click through a couple slides here. Just for example, um, you can see some of the major uh, slides related to the stuff that we just did, right? Um, and um, I'm not sure exactly how they want you to use these, real frankly, but um, you know, here's some of those escape sequences that we talked about. Um, you know, empty strings, and I, th I think we've you know, covered all this stuff here, um, but those are there as well. And, and and I think real frankly that a lot of times those uh, keynotes aren't necessarily useful unless you're looking at the notes that go with them. So like if you can download it and look at the notes part of it, that some of them have good notes, some of them don't. Uh, I just wanna point out that they're there and it's kind of a good auxiliary uh, resource that you can look at if you wanna kind of brush up on your skills or remember something. All right, I'm, I am going to click back in here and, you know, we had just finished up the, the first uh, playground here and we're going to go into the second one. So somewhere on one of my screens, right, and of course it's the one that's probably furthest away. I have a finder window open that I'm trying to find, ironically, um, and, and move on to the next uh, playground here. So um, here's my finder window and uh, we just completed the strings playground, and now we're going to move on to the uh, functions playground. So I'm going to go ahead and open that one up. And my goal here would be to try to finish this one up here today uh, before we call it a day. There's not a lot of pages here, so we should be able to do that pretty efficiently. All right, let, let's um, kind of take a, a grand look here at uh, this concept called functions. Um, and once again, I'm going to throw out the fact that we have these two uh, terms that we use to, to refer to functions typically in programming languages. The one is the word function and in Swift, we actually use the keyword func, F-U-N-C, in order to, to define a function, which is basically what we call a named block of code. So it's, it's code that's got curly brackets around it. Uh, that's, it's got a name. Uh, and then usually parentheses, not usually, but always parentheses after the name of the function that shows um, that it is a function, basically. If a function's built into a more complicated structure, like it's part of another uh, program or class structure, often we will call those methods, um, you know, and mostly what we will create is functions. But I do have the tendency to kind of interchangeably use those two terms um, for better or for worse, right? And, um, you know, the, the reason I, I like to point that out is if you hear me say uh, method and I'm like typing, you know, function on the screen, you know what I mean, right? So that, so that we're kind of on the same uh, playground here, so to speak. Um, all right, let, let's go ahead and try this first little exercise, uh, which is pretty simple. And it's really just kind of a review of how to create a function in the first place. And uh, we're given very specific instructions. And the instruction is to create a function called introduce myself that prints a little message about you on the screen. Uh, we need to call the function and observe the printout. So 
let, let's just start by defining it. So let's do that piece. So we will use the keyword funk. And that's how we do it in this language. Um, that's necessary. Then you start with a name. And we're told to call this introduce myself. Functions are followed by a set of parentheses. The parentheses then are followed by a set of open and closed curly brackets. And all the code that's part of this function is inside those curly brackets. Inside the parentheses, we can include things. So we can include things that we're either sending or receiving in the function for further processing. In this case, it's empty, meaning we're not receiving any external information to run this function. And the function will just execute the code inside the curly brackets. We're told to make it just kind of like a simple little message. So you can do something like, hi, my name is Tacus, for example. Right, just a little hello. Now, interestingly, here's kind of the catch with the function. And I don't know if you guys are, are seeing this in the sidebar. A lot of the other code that we type immediately executes, right? And if it's not executing in the sidebar, it's executing in the console at the bottom. And this isn't putting anything on the screen. Now it's put, not putting anything on the screen because functions do not operate until you call them. So I have to call the function by name with the parentheses, then the code executes. Otherwise it will do nothing. So this is a really common mistake and why we kind of reiterate this. And, and I can't tell you how many times I've had like really like clever, smart, brilliant, uh, even students, they write blocks of code and they'll create all these functions and, and they'll have me look at it and go, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I, I checked it, double checked it, triple checked it. My syntax is good. It's just not working. I'm like, did you ever call the function and ask it to run? And like, dope, you know, and then they remember, oh yeah, yeah, you do got to, you do have to call it. So this is an example of that. So you can name the block of code, but until you invoke it, or call it by name, it's not gonna do anything. All right, so that, that was um, part one. So we're able to define a function, put some code inside of it, and then call it and have it execute. Next, it says, write a function called magic eight ball that generates a random number and then uses either a switch statement or if else if statements to print different responses based on the random number generated. And they give you this, the code for the, the random number generators, uh, generator so you don't have to develop it, just so you remember. This is not something we've spent a lot of time on. Um, every language has some sort of random number generator and it's just a matter of knowing the right syntax to make it work. All right, let's go ahead and, and first um, read the instructions again. So we're either going to do a switch or a if else if statement to, to give different answers depending on the numbers that were generated. Um, the random number generator that they're putting on the screen here is going to generate a number between zero and four. That's the syntax here. We'll, I'll type it in in just a second. Um, and uh, we want to call that function a few times because Every time we call it, there should be a different number, right? And then you can give them the response. Now, the, the point of this is to simulate like a magic eight ball. If you guys have ever played with one of those, um, you know, like it's like this thing, you know, it's got like a weird little cube on the inside. It's not a cube. It's like a weird shape. I, I don't know, dodecahedron like thing inside there with messages on it. And you ask it a question, flip it over and then it puts a little thing in the window. It's like, hey, should I uh, should I marry this woman? You know, all signs point to yes, or you know, it's Valentine's, you know, whatever. You know, it gives you an answer to silly questions. So it's just kind of simulating that. Um, hopes we hope that those are random, right? But if you don't like the answer you get, you can always ask again, right? So let's create the function. Um, and this is where all the stuff is going to go. It's going to go inside this function. So everything the eight ball does is going to be inside those two curly brackets. Now, the random number generator is given. So we're going to do a let statement because we're going to run it, right? 
and for each run, it will create a new constant, right? Um, and we're going to say random, um, it's, you know, whatever you want to call it. That's a good name. Well, they told us what to name it above, which is why you're, if you're wondering why I named it what I did. And then the syntax for it is we wanted to generate random integers. So we start with int, and then we call in the random uh, function, right? And you're recognizing it as a function now because it um, has parentheses, right? That's how you know you're calling a function or a method. Um, this wants us to put in a range. So it has the keyword in colon, that's just got to be there. And then we're just going to put in a range of number. And one way you can do a range of numbers in Swift is you put in your starting number and then dot, 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 your ending number. So this will generate a random number between zero and four, including zero and four. So zero, one, two, three, or four. Okay. Um, interestingly, I'm not really sure how many answers are on that little thing inside of a magic eight ball. And I'm kind of thinking it's more than four. So you could totally ramp this up and, and put more answers in here if you want, you know, no harm done. Um, all right, so I'm gonna choose, instead of doing a if else or if else if kind of thing, I'm gonna use a switch statement because we're gonna be contending with zero, one, two, three, four. That's at least five possibilities. And that's a lot of else ifs to write. I think it's faster to do a, a switch case, by the way. So I'm gonna do a switch. I spell it right though, my switch. What are we switching on? Well, whatever random number was generated, you know, so that, that will have been generated. And we have curlies for the switch. Then we start to list all of our cases. Let's take the case of the number zero. All right, not the colon, but uh, not a semicolon, but a colon here. And then we're basically going to print like little silly messages that the eight ball would say. So here's one example. Um, I don't think so. You want the, the answers to be sufficiently vague to be able to answer any question, right? Like, should I go on a date with her? I don't think so. <laughs> Case one. If number one comes up, then the message would be what? Um, the one I have here is, sorry, ask again. Right, that is one of the answers you get from the Magic 8 Ball. What if uh, two comes up? In that case, let's print a message that says something positive like, absolutely. Right, the punctuation in there, go for it. Then we'll do case three. Another message. And okay, so this is what the author has. So I'm just copying what the author has. So the author says, in your case, Mark, um, not a chance. That's really positive. And then we do have the case of number four. So I could, okay, so here we could talk about this. I could hard code the four, but all the possibilities are on the screen already. If it's not zero, it's not one, it's not two, and it's not three, I know for sure it has to be a four. So I don't have to say case four, right? I can just say default. That will catch the case when it's four. And then we can say another positive one like it's looking good. Like that. So there's my magic eight ball code, right? And I, I'm hoping it's clear to you guys, like at least with this statement, you know, why I didn't do case four, right? Because the random number generator is only going to generate zero, one, two, three, or four. The first four scenarios are covered. This will cover the remainder. Now, of course, I'm going to contend that a magic eight ball probably has more than 
five possible responses, but I could be wrong about that. I, I, I want to say it's like six or eight or more. Um, so you could like alter this. Now, once again, in, you notice none of the print statements are outputting anything because they're inside of a function. It's a name block of code. And more importantly, we're not calling that name block of code. So we're going to call the magic eight ball. And now notice, right? So this is my code from above. So it's triggering in your case. So the, what it generated the first time was a three. You can see that over here, right? It generated a three. Now, yeah. if I call magic eight ball again, I, and you can just copy paste these by the way, right? So calling it again. So it, it gave me a, uh, I don't think so. And it's looking good. So I got a zero and a four, right? If I paste it again, oh, I got two zeros and a four. Here's one where they're all different. Abs oh no, they're not. Absolutely looking good. In, in your case, not a chance. Um, I think there's only one so far that I haven't seen respond. So and there, and there it comes. Sorry, ask again is now coming up. So I, I'm, I'm proving that all of them work. Now it makes sense, right? If there's five different possibilities, right? You'll probably have to run it at least five times to get all the different answers. Makes sense, right? So um, I am getting some repeat here, but you know, the truth is you can run this as many times as you want and it should keep randomizing the answer in the order of the answer. Now that's a that's pretty weird, right? So I don't think so. One, two, three, four times. Sorry, ask again four times, and it's looking good once. Right? Now it's also telling you a little bit something about how the playgrounds work. So if I paste again, right, it doesn't like it on that line. Um, if I paste again, every time it it reruns the code, so all of them re-randomize every time. I'm pretty satisfied that this is truly random and that, that this is correct. You guys okay? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Excellent. Let's move on to the next uh, thing. This is uh, one of the app exercises. Uh, once again, fitness tracking app uh, revisited. Um, and it says functions are key to making your app work. For example, in every exercise dealing with a step count until now, you have simply assigned a number of steps to a step variable. This isn't very realistic seeing as the number of steps you take increments one at a time and continues to change throughout the day, right? If you guys have a smartwatch, and you know that effect. Um, the reoccurring process like this is a perfect candidate for a function. So write a function called increment steps and um, after the declaration of steps below, that will increment steps by one and then print its value. Call the function multiple times and observe the printouts. All right, so we already have the variable declared. So now our job is to kind of just, well, let's do the function first. So here comes a func, and we're gonna call it increment steps. Parentheses, currently empty. Then we put in our, our curlies. And then every time we increment steps, the steps variable will go up by one. So we're just gonna do steps plus equals one. And so we can keep track, we're gonna do output of the steps so we can see that it incremented. Okay. This is really pretty darn simple, honestly, when you start to think about it based on the instructions. Now we need to call it. So we're just gonna call it by name. We're going to run once, so you can see our total is one. We will copy that code. I really don't want to type it. Paste. Should update. And every time I add, it's going to add one. And it, it seems to be working, right? We're not going to get any random numbers here. We're just um, 
you know, looking at it <laughs> and just making sure that every time we call it, it does an increment and it outputs the correct value. So it is working very simplistic, but you know what? Um, strangely, when you think about a, a thing that's tracking your steps, it's exactly what it does, right? It figures out that you stepped, adds one to the total. And if you look at your watch, there it is. It's added to the total, right? So it's not really that dissimilar from the logic that we, we actually use. Um, now there's another part of this, of course, right? It says, if you want to regularly provide progress updates to your user, you can put control flow of statements that check on progress into a function. And it says, write a function called progress update after the declaration of goal below. The function should print, you're off to a good start. If it's less than 10% of the goal, halfway there. If it's less than halfway, go, halfway to the goal, over halfway there, and you're almost there, et cetera, as listed above, right? I'm not going to read all that. Um, all right, so it's just really a matter of writing um, if statements in this uh, situation. Um, could I do this um, with a switch statement? And the answer would probably be no, right? Because a switch statement is looking for particular values. An if statement, however, I can set it up with like the right kind of statement to check a range of values. Like I can check to see if it's less than or greater than. And um, as we're checking values, you wanna kind of follow a scale that makes sense. So I'm gonna start from the smallest values and count up. That's what makes sense to me. All right, let's go ahead and first create the function. So we're gonna do the func and we're gonna call it progress update. Curlies. Right. I'm going to put in um, a constant here. We were told to do that. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to check the percentage of our steps relative to the goal. Okay, so I'm going to say let percent equal, I'm going to do this as a double, right? That's good for percentages. And what we're going to do is we're going to take steps convert it into a double so that we can divide by goal convert it into a, a double, <laughs> right? Now, the reason I'm doing this, right, is to make sure that my calculations on the percent are accurate, right? Because goal is currently an integer, right? So if I just took steps uh, divided by goal, I would get an integer answer. I want a decimal answer so I can get the right percentage. This should be somewhere between the range of, you know, zero to one, right? For percentages typically, but you know, percentages can also exceed, but most of the values will be in that range. So we do need the precision with a double, right? So that's just doing the math in advance. The, the on the fly changing the format to make sure the math is the right, way this is kind of a clever little trick so rather than having this be set to a double to begin with which we could have also done we're just doing the conversion when we need it to do the calculation right, so here comes now the logic so if the percent is less than 10 less than and we say less than 10 percent would be 0.1 right for a percentage then we'll have the message print. Um, and you know what? I might copy paste these in, make it go faster. Um, off to a good start. Else, if the percent is less than 50%, so 0.5. Now we're gonna say, now here, here's my question for you guys, right? From a logic standpoint, if they only get 10% and you say you're off to a good start, okay, that's encouraging. But how do we know we're almost halfway there? Well, they, it's not less than 10%, so it's more than 10% and it's less than half, right? 
That's why we can say you're almost halfway there. They might only be at 11%, but, you know, but it's not, you know, you want to encourage people. If you want to kind of continue this logic stream here, um, you can add the next part of the if. So I, I am copy pasting for speed here. Um, so we can say else if the percent is less than 90, then we can give them the message. We can just copy this one actually. So you're over halfway there instead of almost. You're over halfway there. All right. And then the last statement here, and I want you to contemplate this one. Um, else if steps is less than goal. There's imagine hundred percent, right? Because that would that's kind of the same thing. If they're if they're equal, then we've reached our goal. But if it's still less, but we're over 90, you know, then the message really is uh, print you're almost there. And you're indeed you are. And you, you know, if you really wanted to, you know, you can exceed your goal. You can also add an additional else. They're not asking us to do this, by the way. I'm just adding it. Um, else, at that point, they would have exceeded the goal. So you could just say, I'm not even using proper English here, but the point is, right, that you've exceeded your goal. Great job. And, you know, I, I would argue, like, if you're writing a real app, you'd probably want to get verbose and tell them by how much, right? Um, so there you go. There's some code. Now, of course, um, we want to check it, right? This has no impact of, of course, on reality here because we're not actually like reading live data or anything but if we want to run this is this random no it's not random because we're looking at the steps here the steps are zero so the response is you know you're off to a good start yeah we're less than 10 percent so as you come in here and you start changing uh the value up top here like, so for example, if I put in, you know, 4,000 steps, now it changes, right? So we're at 40%. You're almost halfway there, right? Now, interestingly, I changed it up top here, but I'm still incrementing steps here. <laughs> you know, so I'm adding a little bit to the total, whatever. Um, and then, you know, ideally what would happen here is you would, kind of check all the ranges so i'll do a six thousand so that should catch you know you're over halfway there and then we can get it up to you know nine 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 right oh and that says oh yeah that's right because i'm adding steps at the end so almost at your goal and then if i clear 10k and you know by a few even um, it should say you've exceeded your goal. Right? So there, there's an example of that one. Once again, you got to call it, right? Um, you got to make sure that when you're laying out the logic for an if statement like this, and you're checking numbers over a range, you know, the strong suggestion is, is that you follow a pattern. In this case, I'm going from smallest to biggest, right? In this regard. I could also flip it and start with biggest. I could check to see, have we exceeded the goal? Are we at 90%, you know, et cetera. I can go the other direction, right? That, that's a possibility too. Usually if you go the other direction, you're usually flipping the signs on those statements. This, this approach to me makes a lot of sense. Hopefully you guys are good. I'm gonna move on to the next screen. 
So now we're going to start looking at the stuff that goes inside the parentheses when we do functions. And we're going to add a little bit of a, it's not a wrinkle, you know, this, we did learn this last semester, but this is one of those things that was maybe in one ear out the other and you forgot about it 10 minutes later, and especially what it was called. And so, uh, and that thing is argument labels. Um, right. And we have those two words, parameters and arguments, and the, they're kind of used uh, interchangeably, but generally speaking, if I'm in a function and I'm receiving information, the information I'm receiving, I tend to uh, call those parameters. We're receiving parameters. If I'm in the code that's calling the function and I'm sending the information, then I call it an argument. That's the formal, formally correct way to, to think of it. However, and I say this because I know most programmers kind of use those two terms interchangeably. If you say arguments where you should say parameters or parameters where you should say arguments, nobody will misunderstand you, right? Um, the other way to, to look at it is those are values that we're passing, you know, as another way. Uh, so you're passing a parameter um, or you're receiving an argument or you're receiving a parameter and passing an argument. Uh, either, nobody will fault you. <laughs> However you say it, uh, people will get you, all right? Um, all right, so this one says, write, write a new introduction function called introduction that should take two string parameters, name and home, and one integer parameter called age. The function should print a brief introduction, for example, uh, Mary, California, and 32. If we sent those into the function, it might print Mary, comma, 32, comma, is from California. Right, so let's see if we can make that happen. So let's create a func. We're gonna call it introduction, parentheses, curly. Now I'm gonna go back inside here and add stuff inside the parentheses because we were told that we have to. The first thing that we know we're gonna send in is this thing called name. So I'm gonna name it and I'm gonna tell it what data type it is, which is a string. Right. Then we're asked to put home in there. So we're naming it home and it is a string. And then we're also asked to add a age parameter, but this is an integer. And I, I want to really kind of point out like a, a few things that are happening here. Whenever we develop a parameter list like this, and it's three different parameters, first, we do need to know the data type, right? And the fact that we are giving it a name, so the names are in like the light blue here, that's gonna be the name that we use for that variable, because that's really what it is. Inside these curly brackets, we'll be using this variable name. And it's only valid inside those curly brackets. The other thing is, is that we're accepting a name as a string, um, the home, town or whatever as a string and then the age as an integer when we send the information to the function it also has to go in in that order right the other um thing is is how you call this so well let, let's let's get a print statement in here first so it actually does something so we're just going to do a standard print statement and we're going to use string interpolation so i'm going to say name, so we're going to pull in the person's name, put in a comma, a space, then we're going to pull in their age, comma, and a space, and we're going to say is from space, and then another string interpolation of where they're from. Now, the other important thing is that just because I'm sending the information in in a certain order, doesn't mean I have to utilize it in the same order. So you see the print statements changing the order of stuff, but it doesn't matter, right? It's able to receive it. And really, um, you know, to be really precise about this, it really should have a period here. All right. Now, once again, in the sidebar, you're noticing it's not doing anything because we need to call it in order to have it do something. 
So down here, um, we're gonna go ahead and call it. Now, something really interesting happens when you've created a function and it has parameters inside of it. And I'm gonna kind of, you know, I'm gonna not say let go of the wheel, but let go of the code <laughs> as I'm typing mm -hmm. and let the IntelliSense hopefully kick in here and notice it found my function, right? I only typed a few letters. And it also says you need name, home, and age. Is that the version you wanna use? Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> it absolutely is. And then notice what it does here is it drops in the variable names for the function and then puts generic placeholders in for the stuff that we're supposed to send. So now I gotta type this stuff in. I'm just gonna use what, what their example was. So I'm gonna type Mary. And, and I guess that should be a capital M. Then you can hit your tab key, by the way, and it'll take you to the next field. And now I need another string. Let me say California. Tab again. And now I'm going to hard code an integer. And they were using 32. That doesn't have quotes, right? Because it's an integer. Now you can see at the bottom, it is doing the output. It says Mary comma space 32 comma space is from California and it's working. So we are able to pass the stuff in. I think it's really neat that you can create something that the IntelliSense engine reads in what's expected and helps you fill it out. I think that's really cool, right? That, that's very helpful, All right? So that was part one. Next thing says, write a function called almost addition that takes two int arguments. The first argument should not require an argument label. The function should add two ar the two arguments together, subtract two, and then print the result. Call the function and observe the printout. Okay, so a bunch of stuff going on here. And um, we got this thing um, called an argument label that we're talking about. So in other words, uh, we got to contend with that piece. Um, and there's a special technique uh, basically for doing that. Now, I'm getting a weird error here and I'm not really sure why. I, I guess I'm not too worried about it, but it, it's still working. All right, I'm gonna go ahead now and um, build this next little thing. So we got to build the function first. So let's, let's do that. We'll use the keyword func. We're going to call it almost addition, parentheses and curly brackets. Now we're going to go back and add stuff inside here. Um, and it says uh, it takes two int arguments. So we're going to send two int numbers. So normally what we do, for example, is this. We do first number int right and then we do second number and call that an int. and then we be done and move on right um however we want here in front of the first one and so the first argument should not require an argument label and in order to make that happen we use this underscore and this this is I don't know if you guys vaguely remember this or not. This is a really easy one to forget, but like why on earth and, and what the heck does that mean? And basically what that does is it we don't have to send the information in with the name attached to it. So in other words, up here, right? If I wanted to send in Mary, I'm putting the name of what I'm sending it into first. So it kind of knows where to go. Same thing with age. By putting in the underscore, I can skip that part of it and I can just pump the value directly in, right? So, all right, let's work on the output statement and then I'll show you like how, how in calling it, that's really kind of useful. So we'll say print first number plus second number minus two. So it'll give us the answer, whatever the answer is, doesn't really matter. So now let's call this and, and you'll see how this is really helpful. So I'm gonna call all, almost addition. And see how it still puts in the name here, but 
and notice the whole thing is highlighted. That means that I don't have to keep the name there. I'll just type in the number eight. Oops, not asterisk, but eight. And then the second number, which we didn't put the blank in front of in the parameter declaration, that name is going to stay, and I'm just going to put in the number six. All right. So now it's going to do a little bit of math. So it's going to add the first number to the second number, which is 14, subtract two, and it's 12. So that's the right answer. So it's working. All right. But you see the advantage here, right? That if you use this, which is um, negating the argument label, and I forget what they call it when it's a blank. If I did the same thing here, so if I put in an underscore on this one, then I could just simply do this and it would work. See the difference, mm -hmm. right? Um, now I'm gonna control Z that. So we have like a mix of both, um, but this technique becomes very, very handy, especially if you have a lot of data that you're sending in or don't wanna have to think about the name of something, you know, as you're typing it, just, it, it is just very handy. Um, they also use it as kind of a way to like alter the way that you're reading the code and converting it to English. Um, not, not really too hard to wrap your head around, but you'll, you'll see it. The more you use it, the more it makes sense. All right. Next, they're having us write a function called multiply that we're basically going to do the same kind of thing, right? But here's the wrinkle. The second argument should have an external label called by that differs from the internal label. Okay, so let me code this and I'll show you what they're trying to get to here. And this is one of the reasons why Swift is kind of gaining popularity in, in some regards because it has these kind of weird syntax things that help the, the code read like it's magic almost, right? We're gonna be multiplying. So whatever we do here, we're gonna multiply the first number by the second number and put the result on the screen. That's gonna be the output. But in terms of what we put inside the parens, we are gonna use um, a, the underscore. So we, we're skipping the argument label. We're still gonna call it first number. This is the first number uh, and that's a double in this case. And then we're gonna, you know, normally we'd put in like second number, right? And we would also make that a double. What they're asking us to do here is as a label for the second number, we're gonna use the keyword by. And when you um, start to read this through and it, it makes more sense when you see the function call. So watch what happens here. First, let, let's get the, the print message built. And basically we're just gonna take the first number and we're gonna multiply it against the second number. It doesn't matter you know, what we label it, right? So that's what the, the function does. Now, when I do the call, if I nicely name my function, which is multiply, I can throw in a number. The first one does not need a label, right? So I can just put the number in. So I can put in, for example, 7.2. Comma, and see, I'm breaking out of the the IntelliSense on this, and I, I almost kind of want to use the IntelliSense. We're going to use that format. So I'm going to put in 7.2 by, what am I multiplying by? This is where it gets clever, you know, 1.5 or whatever your number is. So multiply, look at the syntax of it, right? Multiply 7.2 by 1.5. That's pretty slick actually, right? There's no other language I can think of that allows you to kind of do this. And these are called argument labels, right? We can use those argument labels on the inside here to do stuff, or in some cases, we just use it so that when we're calling the code externally, it's labeled as by, even though really we're meaning second number, just so that when we read the function call, Multiply 7.2 by 1.5. Totally, you know, it reads beautiful is, is kind of the point. Really kind of a weird thing. They must have like thought about this a long time 
to develop this to just so that they could have more readable code. But that was really the objective. And you know what? It succeeds. When you set stuff up really well, it's a really kind of effective little technique. So argument labels uh, in this case can be used. They can be generic or they can be specific. And really the grand goal is to come up with something that has a very clear readable syntax when a user is looking at it. And you don't really have to guess at what's going on because it's written well, right? And the syntax is, is clear. All right, let's uh, look at this next one here. And this gets uh, once again, a little bit um, deeper here um, on this. I'm just, yes, I'm looking at my cheat sheets, if you guys are wondering. All right. Next one gets a little more complicated. It says, uh, these exercises reinforce Swiss concepts tracking app once again. So in this case, it says, you might wanna provide input to a function. For example, the progress function you wrote in functioning app exercise might be um, located in an area of your project that doesn't have access to the value of steps and goals. In that case, whenever you call the function, you would need to provide it with the number of steps that have been taken and the goal for the day so it can print the correct progress information. Cumbersome, right? So rewrite the, the function progress update, only this time give it two parameters of type int called steps and goal respectively. Like before, it should print the same messages, um, call and observe the printout, call it a number of different times, passing in different values and observe the outputs and make sure that they're basically correct. Right, so to kind of save a little bit on the time factor here, we've kind of written this code already, so we're not gonna rewrite it. You know, that that's kind of the, the grand goal. So we're gonna go back um, to here, right? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna copy this code and then we're just gonna tweak it. So going back a couple of uh, slides or screen, and then grabbing that. I'm gonna paste that in here, so pasting. But now we're gonna update the parameter call here, and we're gonna call um, steps into this, and that's gonna be an integer, um, that's a capital I for int. And then we're also gonna feed in the goal, which is also an int. And, and notice here, it doesn't change how the app operates, but it will change how we call it, right? So like the, the calling of the app will kind of look like this. And you, you can do this a few times, but even one successful run, it's okay. So we're gonna call progress updates with steps and goal. We're gonna type in some numbers. So for example, I'll type in 5,013 and my goal is 10,000, all right? It should output what? You're over halfway there. That's correct. You can try different values here, of course, to see if it's working. And you see that it is, right? The difference here, of course, is that um, we're able to feed in different values. So not only different step amounts, but different goal amounts as well. And we're doing that dynamically. Uh, all right, it says your fitness tracking app is going to help runners stay on pace to reach their goals, right? A function called pacing that takes four double parameters called current distance, total distance, current time, goal time. Your function should calculate whether or not the user is on pace to hit or beat the goal time. If yes, print, keep it up. <laughs> and if uh, otherwise print, you've got to push a bit harder. All right, so here goes the coding on this one. This is more stuff to pass in. So follow with me here. Um, we're gonna call this pacing. What I like to do is parentheses, curly brackets, make sure that's all good, then put my stuff inside, right? This is just a, a habit because otherwise what happens to me is I forget to do those things and then stuff's not working. And then you're like, what the, heck, what the hell's going on? First one's gonna be current distance. 
that's going to be a double. Then we're going to have total distance, also a double. Then we'll do the current time. Let's do that as a double as well. Although there is a date time thing, by the way. And then we also have goal time, also a double. All of these are doubles. Why? Because they told us they should be. That's why. Then we're going to set up a constant here called pace. So we're going to say let pace equal the current time divided by, and see now you really have to think about this, but I'm just going to do the formula because I don't want to think about it right now. We're going to put inside parentheses the current time divided by the total distance. And you'll have to take on faith that this is correct. But we have to do the divisor division first before we do the other division. So the, the order of operations is critical here if you want to get the right answer, right? But this is the correct formula. Then we need our if statement to check everything. So we're just going to say if the pace is less than the, the goal time, not, not up to snuff, or actually that would be, um, okay, yeah, that would be okay. That would be a good result. We would say, Keep it up, right? Otherwise, we don't need to do a check here, just do the other scenario, because it's not working, right? And something like, you've got to push it just a bit harder, something like that. Now, of course, we're gonna have to call this, right? And once again, um, we're adding more parameters, um, and it's expecting doubles all the way across, but I'm going to fudge it a little bit and put some integers and some uh, floating point numbers in here. So watch what I do here. So I'm going to call pacing. And then a double, I'll put in 100. Pressing tab here to go to, from field to field. I'll make this one 200. The time, uh, we're going to go 6.0. I'm not really even sure what that means. Uh, <laughs> And then I'll do 10.0, and why am I using these numbers? Because this is what the author used, and I want to make sure that my numbers work out, basically. That's really what the answer is. So um, this is what I'm getting here. So if I my current distance is 100, total distance is 200, current time 6.0, and goal time 10.0, it says you got to push it just a little bit harder. You know, So in other words, I got to do a little bit more to get up to that level. So this is practice in doing like more complex parameter passing, um, you know, you might think, well, how many things can I pass? Well, I don't know how many can you handle thinking about is really the answer. That, that's really the answer. In this case, we're passing four things in. The IntelliSense does kick in though, like the moment you start typing it, if it finds your function, it shows you the stuff that needs to be passed in and the data format. So, you know, that's why I'm hovering here right now. It shows what the stuff is and the data format it's expecting to receive. And then once you've selected that, then you can just tab between the fields and fill in the values. All right. So I'm, I'm control Z in those last two steps. All right. We are kind of at the point where we're just about done here and I'm looking at the clock and here's what I'm going to do. We got two pages of this left, all right? And so I'm not gonna finish these here today. So I'm gonna let this sit until next time. And what I'm hoping that the guys in the session here, you should take these last two slides home and try to see if you can do them on your own. When we get back together next week, we'll check them and see if we all have the same answer and then move on. But I'm gonna stop the recording here and we'll call it a day. <laughs>